Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Amanda Thomas, and I would love to welcome you to Science on Tap. We are here to talk about bird love, the family life of birds with Dr. Wenfei Tong, who is a biologist, author, and environmental advocate. And we uh, had originally scheduled this event for back in March and uh, had to reschedule. And we're glad that you're all here this evening. Very excited to hear what Wenfei has to talk about this evening. And um, for those of you who don't already know, this is a book that she has. It's a wonderful, uh, there's some amazing photos and amazing information in there. I highly recommend it. And want to mention that the um, principal and Press, who is the, the publisher of the book, is offering a 30% discount on this book if you purchase it directly through the Princeton site. You have to go to their site and you enter the code WTONG through August 31st. You can get um, Bird Love and also uh, Wenfei's other book, Understanding Bird Behavior. And some of you may, that may sound familiar um, because she was on our, uh, was a speaker at one of our events back in September of last year. And uh, we have a recording of that on our YouTube channel if you're interested in going back and hearing that as well. So again, you can get 30% off of this book or her other book, Understanding Bird Behavior, if you go to the, the Princeton site. And I believe that the folks are going to be putting that uh, link into the chat here in just a moment. So um, also quick note, if you hear something that says you're uh, this event is being recorded. That doesn't have anything. It, it is being recorded. Um, none of you will appear on camera um, or on uh, audio or anything like that. Um, if you hear that on Zoom, you could ignore that. Um, it's just a setting that they automatically do sometimes. So not sure that that's going to happen, but there you go. Okay, so for those of you who are new to Science on Tap, we are uh, an event that's based in Portland, Oregon, that we are trying to talk about science with adults. We think it's really important for adults to know about science and understand how science works. And we think that um, talking about birds is a lot of fun. A lot of you think that as well. Um, we are hoping to get back to in-person events at some point in the not too distant future. And you can, um, well, mention that let's see uh oh if you are interested in some of our previous online events um, and i think we have a couple in-person events on there as well you can go to our youtube channel which is uh youtube.com science on tap o r w a you can also um hear some of our previous podcast episodes and if you notice the the fourth one over um I also had a, a podcast episode where Wenfei and I sat down and chatted about her past and growing up and why she became a biologist and some of the really cool things that she's done traveling around the world and, and talking to people about science. So if you haven't hear, heard our podcast episode, our podcast is called A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. It's episode 51. I highly recommend it. It's a fascinating conversation. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I, I would love to welcome Dr. Wenfei Tong, again, biologist, author, amazing artist, amazing photographer, environmental advocate. Really excited to have Wenfei here and um, take it away, Wenfei. Oh, thanks, Amanda. So let me share my screen with everyone. Um, thanks so much for coming. I know everyone's quite excited to just enjoy the summer weather now that it's cooled down a bit in Portland and the pandemic is at least at bay for the moment since a lot of us are now vaccinated so thanks for coming tonight. Um, as Amanda said I talked a lot about the other book that I've written but this is my first book and so in, in a sense it's like my first baby and I'm very fond of it and it's called Bird Love and I just pulled up the cover here because I'm sure a lot of you have, well, you've just seen it, that Amanda's brought it up, but it's um, it's not a cover I got to choose, but I think the artist who did the, chose the cover, the graphic designer who chose the cover, did a really good job with this because the book, although the title is Bird Love, it's love with a double-edged sword kind of meaning. So I'm not just talking about love in a purely pretty, sentimental, lovey-dovey, everything is sweetness and light sense. There's also the sad, dark underbelly of, you know, love can sometimes translate to a lot of other strong emotions. And so I, these two are 
a species of New Zealand parrot called keos. And they're very, very smart birds. Even for parrots, they're really smart and very sociable. And you can see from their rather dangerous looking curved bills that they're, in, among other things, scavengers. They quite like eating meat, which is not a very parrot like thing to do. So these are, you know, very sweetly grooming each other, but they have a slightly beady look in their eyes, I think, which encapsulates both the, to me, the light and dark sides of bird love, which the book is very much about. Just a bit about myself, for those of you who haven't um, encountered me before, I'm currently living in New York. And so the main way I get out, I'm in Brooklyn right now, and I take my dog to the park for walks every morning. So one of the ways I coped during the pandemic was to start sketching a lot of the birds I was seeing every morning during the spring migration, because it was just really grim being stuck in the apartment all the time otherwise. Uh, but before that, I managed to do some really nice field work in various parts of the world. And that has done a lot to inspire some of the examples and some of the photographs in this book. So for example, one of the questions, I'm, I'm an evolutionary biologist by training. And so one of the questions I start off the book with is why is there so much variation in different forms of what you could call bird love? Everything from how they decide how to um, how many mates to have, so different species as well as within species and di different individuals have different levels of monogamy to promiscuity. And so how, how and why do birds have these differences? And right here, I've got a photograph of break-up social weaver nests in Kenya, where I used to do a lot of field work. And you've got Mount Kenya in the background. But one of the cool things about weaver birds in particular is within that one family of birds, you've got a heck of a lot of variety of different ways of living, different ways of spacing individuals, as well as different mating systems. So you've got everything from highly monogamous solitary pairs that live in the forest, in the rainforest, and they don't, in, they don't interact with any other birds of the same species, really, to birds like these grey-capped social weavers that have individual units, but they're all within the same tree. So they're, they're semi-colonial nesters. And there's another layer of complexity going on with these grey capped social weavers, because very often you have more than a pair taking care of a single nest of chicks. So in that sense, it's um, a version of what we call cooperative breeding. And then you've got all the way to these birds called sociable weavers, which occur in Southern Africa, which build huge condominium nests that last for years and they they sometimes get so big that they just break the branch of the tree and everyone has to start all over again so um why does that variation exist is one of the questions i discuss in the book and um another one is just debunking the general assumption or myth that a lot of birds just because we see them in pairs and happy couples are necessarily monogamous pairs for life. So there's been a lot of DNA evidence and behavioral evidence now showing that even when birds mate socially for a long time or for a year, that they don't necessarily um, remain genetically faithful to their partner. And also, uh, in terms of other varieties, in terms of how birds caught each other, there's questions about why the sexes sometimes look different. So in this case, I've got two examples here where the sexes look very, very similar, and that's common for a lot of birds like these puffins over here. But you've got other birds like willow ptarmigan, and um, I just saw these birds for the first time in Canada on Hudson Bay, so I was very excited that at that point. Um, but on the left, you've got, this is a typical bird scenario. You've got the dowdier one, which is the female on the left, and the slightly more gaudy looking specimen is typically the male. But we'll talk about exceptions to this rule. So one of the questions is why that's, why you've got this sex difference and what caused that to evolve. And just on the lines of having variety within a whole group of birds, uh, Ptarmigan are actually chickens, 
the, the rhythm, the chicken order. So I would, I just thought that I'd show you some other chickens that I'm fond of. Um, and one of the things that characterizes ptarmigan is they're actually surprisingly monogamous for, for the chicken order. So a male will typically guard, he'll find a female and the two will pair up at least for the season and not, not really stray from each other. But this is in contrast to something like the spruce grouse, where this is just the male, and I haven't drawn the female here. Uh, they're also known as fool hens, and you'll have a species of spruce grouse in Oregon. They're, they're called fool hens because they're not, very, they're not very bright about noticing dangerous things. So I remember walking to this male on the trail in Montana, and he was just sitting there having a sip of water from a puddle. And after about five minutes, he looked up and noticed that I was there on the trail and got into a big fluster and flew up into a branch that was just about a meter high. So I level with me and then, and then settled down and looked really comfortable and gave me this look like, now you can't touch me. So, so people, unfortunately, I, I mean, they're really easy targets and they're not bad eating, so they get killed a bunch. But the, where I was going with the spruce grouse is they're another chicken um, relative. And they have multiple females mating with each male. So the female will sort of, each female will, in a sense, hedge her genetic bets by mating with a number of males. But the males, because they live in the forest, seem to display on their own. In contrast to a lot of other grouse chicken species, which form what we call leks, which are a rather interesting uh, situation where you've got multiple birds all displaying on the same courtship ground at once. So a lek is both referring to that stage that the male birds are displaying on. This is a sharp-tailed grouse that I saw in Alaska. And um, it's giving the females a gallery of sperm donors, essentially from which to choose and uh, the males will gather on this lek, this dancing ground and display and every species has its own display um, behaviors and special ornaments so in this case the male sharp-tailed grouse is showing off his very fancy purple throat patches as well as these crests over his eyes which he's erected and if you were to look at something like the turkey uh, if anyone's been chased by a turkey before, you'll notice that these fleshy eyebrows on a lot of chicken species get, it's almost like they get engorged and very, very colourful when the bird's excited. And so it, uh, I've been chased by turkeys where the skin was all blue at the start and then suddenly it turned increasingly bright red. And <laughs> before I knew it, the turkey was chasing me. So it, it's quite interesting how the blood gets all engorged as part of the, the blood engorges the organs as part of the display. The other fun thing about sharp-tailed grouse is they have a special dance maneuver which involves pirouetting. So they'll stick up their little tails like this. And I've got a, another back view of the grouse. It's not, it's not the world's best photo, but it shows you what the lek looked like. They, these prairie birds tend to choose very, very sparse places for their dancing grounds, for their legs. And there are a couple of people in the background who are also watching the dance. But you can see this back view of the bird shows you that sharp tail from the back. And it just looks like a misshapen powder puff to me. And the, all the males will be whirring at once, like little helicopters, and then they'll all stop. And meanwhile, the females are just walking around getting, assessing the, the different males and deciding who they're going to mate with. Um, I should specify that in the, among the chickens, none of the males participate in the parental care much. So the females typically, the, the only investment the male's making is his sperm, his genetic material. So that it's really important for the females, from the female's point of view, to choose a good genetic investment. And she's not very interested in whether the male would make a good dad because he doesn't help with that aspect of uh, child, child investment. And um, I thought I would give a shout out to the 
jungle fowl, which is the ancestor of all domestic chickens. This is this was taken in my parents' backyard in Singapore, and it's a very it's become quite a common wild bird because I think people have reintroduced it to Singapore and Malaysia, which is very very nice to see. So sometimes I, if I go home, I get woken up by a jungle fowl male crowing. But that's a you can see he's he's quite amped up too with his wattles and his crest all erect. Ah, uh, so it's it's nice to know that even domestic chickens have a very handsome ancestor. And so the question is, why are these why are the males so ornamented and why are the females so relatively dowdy? So this is a um, theory that goes all the way back to Charles Darwin, and it was first mentioned by Charles Darwin in the Origin of Species. It's this idea of sexual selection. So in this case, rather than having uh, humans do the selecting, if we were selecting for different dog breeds, for instance, or different types of potatoes or something like that, it's, and it's not nature doing the selection in the sense that you're looking for organisms well adapted to the environment. You're literally getting one sex to choose traits in the other one. And there's a great example also from chickens. These are black grouse in Europe where they did an experiment to look at exactly how you could get the females to choose certain males over others at a lek, and whether or not the females are basing their choices purely on physical characteristics like how large the males are or how well they dance or how bright red their little eyebrows are versus something else that's more arbitrary. And so... What I love about this experiment is it's very, it was done quite some time ago, about 40 years ago, and it's very, very low tech. There's no special video cameras or robots or machine learning or anything involved in it. All they did was put a few stuffed female black grouse out around certain males that were not initially very popular at the leg. And in doing so, they created an immediate heartthrob a sort of star star wonder where just having this audience effect of more females clustered around a particular male at this dancing ground caused him to be more popular because his popular it's like the other females were following a fashion. So just the fact that they saw more females clustered around one guy made all the others think, oh, maybe they're onto something and he must be a stud after all. So they turned some, the experimenters turned some of the male black grouse into uh, more exciting specimens than they originally were to the females. So that's all chicken examples, but I didn't want everyone to come away with the idea that in birds, it's always the females choosing the males and it's always the males who are ornamented. So I also talk about other species like uh, I talk quite a lot about blue-footed boobies in the book just because they're so charismatic and they're very funny. And there's a lot of work done on them, especially from the Galapagos. And you'll see that this is a courting couple and they're both showing off their brilliantly blue feet. And there's not that much difference between the male and the female. So this is a very good example of mutual mate choice. And there are tons of examples of this among birds. It's not just uh, exotic things like blue-footed boobies. It's also birds that you would see in your backyard uh, if you live in the right parts of North America. So one of my, um, and they do incidentally choose each other based on the blueness of their feet. So the courtship dance involving the waving of feet is is not an accident. It's, it's something they use to judge the quality of the mates. And blue-footed boobies do stay with their mates for most of their lives. There is divorce, but it's fairly rare. Um, and there is some extra pair sort of affairs, but also it, that, that varies and it's not particularly common compared to a lot of other birds. So this is an example of a mate choice that's quite complicated, but I love the story and I almost wanted to do my PhD on it. It's, it does involve genetics. I saw Amanda had a, a topic in, including genetics in one of the surveys that she's going to have everyone do at the end of the talk. 
So these are both individuals of um, the species called white-throated sparrow, which is very, very common on the east coast of North America. But you'll notice that one of them has a completely tan head, so we call them tan-striped birds, and the other has white stripes on its head. And yet they're the same species. And it turns out that both sexes, there's 50% of the birds are tan-striped and 50% of the birds are white-striped, and both sexes have an equal number of white-striped and tan-striped birds. So, so what's going on? Uh, it turns out that opposites attract in this species. And there's quite a cool adaptive evolutionary explanation for why opposites do best as couples. So um, the, the underlying cause of the difference in color is actually a gene on, the, on one of the chromosomes, chromosome two in these birds that either causes them to have a tan stripe or a white stripe. But what's cool about this um, bit of the chromosome is it's not just one gene that's inherited differently in birds. It's a set of genes inherited like a cassette in a package. Um, and so in addition, very near the gene for the color of the head is a bunch of genes that have to do with personality and behavior. And it turns out that birds of either sex, male or female, that are tan in color are very, very sweet, very good parents, very conscientious, very good at feeding the children, very monogamous. Um, but they're, they're so sweet that they're a bit of a pushover. So they're not very good at hanging on to things like their territory. Whereas birds that are white striped on the head tend to be much bolder and very good at doing things like hanging on to a good territory, finding a good territory, singing to hang on to it and defending it. But they make fairly poor parents. They don't feed the children as often and they don't stay around as often. They're more likely to go and look for someone else to have an affair with once, whenever they can. So you can imagine if you had two white striped birds or two tan striped birds, you wouldn't end up having a lot of offspring. And the birds seem to know this too. So you tend to only see pairs, breeding pairs that have uh, one, one of each color of both sexes. So that keeps, that sort of keeps the colors at the 50-50 ratio in all the natural populations we've observed, which is just a very cool example of keeping diversity going in a natural population. Uh, along the lines of extra, extra marital affairs, if you want to put it that way, is another backyard bird, but this is a very common backyard bird in Australia called the superb fairy wren. It's very small, about chickadee size or smaller. And here I've got a drawing of a male displaying to a female because among other things, these birds are the Guinness Book World of Records for having offspring that are not genetically the, uh, the offspring of the male who's taking care of them. And the reason this happens is the males will spend a lot of time soliciting, courting females that are neighbors. And the females will disappear at dawn and go, go to neighbors that they like the look of and have a, little, have a little fling on the side before going back home to her own territory. So this is a male displaying with a flower petal. That's one of the little uh, courtship presents that they bring. And it's quite funny that um, among these birds, at least, the males only caught with flowers to neighboring females. They don't caught to their own social long-term bonded mate with flowers, um, which you, you can draw the parallels you like from that. Uh, it's so, so I spent quite a lot of the book talking about different courtship strategies and mating systems, both in exotic birds like birds of paradise, as well as in very common backyard birds across the world. Um, I also talk about things like nest building. So this is just a cute example I like because it emphasizes that things like common names are not very helpful sometimes. So this is a South American oven bird. 
otherwise known as a Rufus Hornero. And it's called an oven bird because apparently the oven that it con I mean the oven, the nest it constructs out of mud resembles a sort of oven in places like Argentina. But you often see these oven bird nests on the tops of posts, uh, fence posts and things like that. So confusingly, if any of you are birders, you'll know that in North America, we have an oven bird too. And that is just a complete accident of common names because the two birds, the two oven birds are completely unrelated. They don't look anything alike. So the North American oven bird is actually a warbler and it lives on the ground. Uh, nests on the ground mostly, and usually forages on the ground too. And it's a lot smaller than the Hornero, but like the Hornero, it builds this enclosed, in a sense, oven-like nest, the, therefore the name. So that's just an example of how you can't trust common names, but also it's it's an example of a very beautiful nest structure that I think I talk about in the book. And then, obviously, once you've finished nesting, the, the book sort of steps chronologically through different phases of bird family life, essentially. So the next step after making a nest is, of course, feeding the chicks. And as anyone with children must know, the, once you have the children, they're not, they're not just empty, passive vessels to be filled. They, they have opinions and they can be quite hard work. So here I've got a boreal chickadee with its little bill crammed. And there's a lot of work, especially in temperate regions, on how tight the window is for birds to find enough food to feed their chicks. So it's really, it's really become an important question for things like climate change, because if the birds don't come back from migration at the right time and don't time their chicks to arrive and hatch at a time that coincides with a peak of food because the, the peak caterpillar season is offset due to climate change. They end up not rearing the same sizes of broods that they used to. And so there's a big question about which birds can adapt to these changing temperatures and seasons fast enough to keep up with how that affects the food sources. And especially for things like boreal chickadees that nest very far north and for which climate change is, you know, a lot more, the impacts are a lot more pronounced at the moment. Um, so you'll have heard me talk a lot about things like investment, use words like investment. So I just thought I would bring up this image from the book, which makes the differences in investment very clear. So on the left, you've got a chicken, typical domestic chicken, and a scaled image of a chicken egg. So you can see that as a proportion of the mother's body weight, the chicken is not investing as much in her egg as the kiwi is in hers. So on the right-hand side, you've got the absolute, the size of a kiwi's egg relative to the kiwi. And that's the biggest egg that's the largest investment for maternal weight that we have in living birds now, and it's dramatic. Um, so that sort of, what, that, that's a very palpable example of what I mean by differing investments. But of course, this carries on right through the rearing of the chicks and the making of the nests and the, um, the, the whole thing. So the egg is just the first bit of the investment and once you've got a couple of birds or more taking care of the chicks and you've got the chicks involved as well then there's a lot more room for negotiation about who should do the investing um which brings me to the question of who gets left holding the eggs so in some in some species um like this european starling here feeding its chicks you always have at least one parent, often both parents, taking care of the chicks. But there are cases where there are experiments where scientists have given starlings extra nests, nest holes, very near each other. And in those cases, 
it's easier for the males to two time a, a bunch of females so that they can have multiple nests at once. So sometimes this is a situation where it's basically driven by resource distributions. If you have enough nest holes to accommodate more families, it might be possible for one or both sexes to have multiple broods. Um, but it's not really answering the question of which sex gets to abscond. And that varies from species to species, but there's a ton of variety, especially among shorebirds. So you'll find that there's some shorebird species where it's always the male taking care of the offspring. And that's the case here with the, this jacana. So um, they're all legs because they're also known as lily trotters since they have these lovely long toes that allow them to walk on top of lily pads in water. And so this is a male with at least two chicks, probably more given the number of legs. And he's, he's the only caregiver. The females have, in jacanas, the females are larger than the males. They're more aggressive. They compete for multiple male mates and they defend their territories. And within that territory, each female has several males, all of whom she lays eggs for. And then the male is the only parent in charge of incubating those eggs and rearing the chicks. And if his eggs get eaten by a predator or something, his, his, the female just comes around and lays him another clutch of eggs and then he's in charge of them again. So this is purely paternal care. And that's actually not so uncommon among um, some of the more, some of the birds that branched off evolutionarily earlier. But among other shorebirds, uh, you've got situations where either parent can abscond because shorebird chicks don't take a lot of work to take care of. You can see that they're quite fuzzy and, you know, they clearly have legs that they can run with. And they often get like that from moment within moments of hatching so unlike something like a starling chick or a robin chick they're quite independent and you generally only need one parent to take care of them anyway so you have other bird species like piping plovers or snowy plovers where whichever sex is in more demand whichever sex is rarer whether it's the males or the females and you can do experiments where you manipulate sex ratio uh, that rarer sex is the one that can find a new partner faster. And so they're the sex that's more likely to abandon the nest and their partner and just start again. Uh, so, so these birds can be both very varied across species as well as within species. But to get back to the stay-at-home dads concept, um, these are ostrich chicks, and I just put these up because Ostriches and emus and cassowaries and rears, birds, these large flightless birds are some of the ones to branch off earliest in bird evolution. And they almost all have largely paternal care. So the males are the ones that do much more of the caring for the chicks than the fem and the incubator of the eggs than the females do. And they actually make these communal nests where you've got multiple females laying in one ostrich nest and the males do more of the work taking care of the eggs. This is also quite common in woodpeckers. So this is a flicker and um, these are variable within species. So you sometimes, but you quite often see a situation where you've got one woodpecker female at a nest hole and she's attended by more than one male who's mated with her. And there's multiple fathers that share the work of taking care of the chicks in addition to, the, to their mother. And I also wanted to bring up the fact that, of course, chicks are not passive. So the chapter also has a lot about sibling rivalry. And I, I just put up a bar burrowing owl chick here because owls are quite well known for a situation where you've got more eggs than the parents are likely to be able to hatch and fledge successfully. And the extra eggs are usually thought of as insurance in case it's one, one of them is addled or something, you've got extra 
extra ones to hatch and otherwise the youngest one tends to be the smallest chick and often starves starves to death if it if there isn't enough food so it's a situation where the odds are definitely stacked against the runt of the litter that's very common among birds of prey or large large birds like herons and egrets and um so those are some of the more the, the earlier stages of family life but at the end of the book i've got a few chapters devoted to some of the exceptions so one of them is to have multiple birds taking care of the offspring rather than just one or two parents and we can call that group breeding or in more technical term is cooperative breeding so these are white fronted bee eaters which are one of the first examples of that behavior in africa uh, but there, it turns out there's quite a lot of different ways you can have this group breeding strategy play out. And one of them, anyone who's familiar with cities where the real estate is very expensive will sympathize with this. It's a, a result of what we call delayed dispersal. So this is a gray jay or Canada jay in North America. And it's often a delayed dispersal, which means that there's basically not enough real estate for the younger birds to set up territories of their own. And as a result, they tend to stay with their parents for more than way beyond their of breeding age themselves. And they should be independent, except they can't find a place to settle on their own and they can't afford it. So they hang out at home or they if they can't hang out with their parents, they hang out with other adults who are in mated pairs. And in that sense, that's the delayed dispersal bit. But then they have to do something to make to earn their keep. They they're generally not allowed to just stay as hangers on without contributing something to the rent or to the childcare. So there's often a uh, within biology there's actually a pay to stay hypothesis, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's essentially you've got to earn your keep, either by helping to take care of subsequent younger broods of chicks and eggs, or in the case of things like grey jays, contributing to a communal larder by doing things like, um, these birds will stick bits of food to the trunks of trees with this sticky saliva. And for birds that live far north, like these grey jays, that's, that's a very helpful behaviour to have when you're trying to get through the hard winter. Another correlate with uh, something that tends to be found in a lot of cooperative breeders like grey jays is very harsh or unpredictable environments. So here you've got a Florida scrub jay and there are many species of scrub jay, but the Florida scrub jay is um, exceptional in being a what we call a cooperative breeder in the sense that they are literally family clans of these birds that um, will pass down their very big territories which the parents have uh, added to over time with their, their growing family. They'll pass it down to one of their descendants. And so there's a, it, it, there's a lot to relate to in terms of human history and literature. <laughs> When, when you look at the behavior of cooperative breeders. And uh, one of the thoughts is for Florida scrub jays, the habitat is quite sparse and hard to, it's hard to find a lot of food. So rather than having lots and lots of pairs all breeding at once, it makes sense for them to just have a relatively few, few breeding pairs and lots and lots of helpers at the nest. So that's quite a common strategy among birds in sub-Saharan Africa, in Australia, and in parts of uh, the, of North and South America where conditions are quite harsh and unpredictable. And the last chapter is on one of my favorite subjects, what we call brood parasitism, or you can also think of it as outsourcing the childcare altogether. So this is uh, something I studied quite a lot as a researcher. And it's 
uh, the example here is not a species I studied, but it's the most common and the most classically studied. It's a European cuckoo, and so that's the big grey bird over here. And that's a brood parasite in the sense that this species, among other, including and other brood parasites, don't ever take care of their own children. They don't even know how to build a nest, even if you ask them to. And they never incubate eggs. They never feed chicks. They don't do any of the work of childcare. All they do is find a nest belonging to another species, which we call the host, and deposit the egg in it. And that's it. They're done. And so the idea here is they get to have a lot more offspring than if they had to do all the investing in feeding the chicks and keeping the chicks warm and making the nest and all that work. They, they just get to go around and you know, find, find other birds to take the eggs. And the biggest example of this in North America is the brown-headed cowbird. So here's a male on the right displaying to a female with his little head slightly bowed and his, his, he spreads his wings and he makes this really high-pitched whistle. And uh, cowbirds are quite a conservation problem in North America, even now, because uh, they're called cowbirds because they used to follow bison and then subsequently cows around so that they could get all the insects that the ungulates flushed up. And since we've developed so much of the northeast and I suppose southeast as well, or and, and the middle of the country, it's resulted in a lot of forest being cut down so that the habitat is much more like what the cowbirds from the prairies are used to. And so they've expanded their range. And the reason this is a conservation problem is all the birds that have not evolved together with cowbirds have no idea how to recognize a cowbird egg and do something about it, reject it or fly away or um, chase the cowbird away or something. All they do is sit on this foreign egg. And that's really bad news for the host birds because what happens is the cowbird chick hatches and it's almost always larger and pushier than the host eggs, uh, I mean host chicks. And so it often ends up being the only chick in the nest because it'll just compete, outcompete everyone else. And all the, all the host birds' own chicks, like if it's a wobbler or something, its own chicks will be dead. And it's just there feeding this foundling, this chick of another species for, for days longer than it would take to raise its own chicks, by which time it's exhausted or the both parents are exhausted. And they've got none of their own genetic investment uh, being successfully raised in future generations. So this, this sets up a bit of an arms race, what you could call an evolutionary arms race. And that, what I mean by that is um, these birds are called parasites because in a sense, they're parasites very much like a disease such as COVID is a parasite. In, but rather than invading an immune system and taking advantage of another species um, to, to make more virus particles, they're basically taking advantage of another species for childcare. And from the host's point of view, that's just bad news because it's an evolutionary dead end to have to pour all your resources into taking care of someone else's children. So that selects for the hosts to be quite good at noticing if there's a foreign egg. But you'll notice from things like forged banknotes that if you've got good detection systems, that selects for good forgeries. And so one of the uh, things I studied in Zambia before um, moving to well, Montana was to look at these uh, examples of egg forgeries in a species of bird called the cuckoo finch in Zambia. So you'll notice that some of these eggs are larger on the top, and then you've got a whole bunch of small eggs on the bottom. And basically, some of these large broken eggs are laid by cuckoo finches as very, very good mimics 
of the host egg, which where you can see all the variety below. So for instance, the in the top right corner you've got um a few reddish reddish pinky eggs. And these are mimics by the cuckoo finch of the reddish eggs down below. And all, all the eggs laid below this line of white eggs are basically laid by one species called the tawny flanked prinia. Every every female has her own signature, but within that species there's a ton of variety. And we think that that variety has evolved in response to the fact that the parasite, the cuckoo finch, has been able to lay such good forgeries that the only way the prinia has been able to make it harder for the cuckoo finch to to mimic the eggs is to present them with a whole lot of variety so that the cuckoo finches don't really know. They haven't figured out how to match the egg specifically to an individual nest of the host species, if that makes sense. Um, if that doesn't make sense, ask me about it after the talk and I'll explain it more. And um, this is one of the things I was studying here was the genetics underlying how you got this egg variation. So I can talk about that more later too, but it, I'll skip it for now because it's it's quite genetics -y. Um And I just didn't want to leave you with the impression that parasitism is uh, always a cross-species thing. So it's also quite common within species. So for instance, uh, ducks in particular are very, very common, what we call opportunistic, um, facultative brood parasites, where if a female has a chance, she'll lay her eggs in someone else's nest, but she doesn't have to, and she also has her own children. So this is a common meganza, and she's got about 20 ducklings behind her, but they're not all hers. So what happens is you just have various females laying extra eggs in each other's nests, and everyone ends up with a few spare, but it's okay for, for ducks in the sense that, again, their children, their, their chicks are quite precocial, and so they don't need a heck of a lot of care. So an extra, an extra 10 ducklings is not going to be as much work as ex 10 extra robin chicks or 10 extra, you know, th those would all fall out of the nest and die. Yeah. The last chapter of the book, and with that I just wanted to uh, provide you with some links in terms of where you can see some of my other photographs or drawings, and to encourage you to support your local bookstore if you don't. Uh, although you should take advantage of the Princeton University Press uh, discount. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, we'll put that that uh, link or that that slide up again at the end, just so that we okay. have a couple of those links already. But I want to make sure that people sure. have a chance to to see your your work. Because um, yeah, uh, obviously, you're um, the folks who have been watching the artwork is pretty amazing. And um, yeah, I, I really enjoy that. So I want to make sure to Sorry, share. I know there's some few. But... No, fine. Um, tried to that too much. <laughs> oh, you're good. Um, so we have some questions. Um, so uh, several questions specifically about the the parasitic birds, and then we have some <laughs> other ones as well. Yeah, I'm sorry, I ran out of time. So I... <laughs> oh, you're good. Um, lots of interesting stuff. Uh, the so are the parasitic birds? Are they laying their eggs in nests where there are already eggs, or how does that work? It's a good question. Um, yes, basically. So. Generally, they have to time the parasite has to time it. That's that's one of the only things that is hard for the parasite female is if she lays in an empty nest. That's a really good cue for the host bird to say, "This can't be mine. I'm abandoning this nest. This is this is weird. I, I don't trust the situation." So, and and similarly, if the host bird has finished her clutch she's also unlikely to but you know to be convinced by a new egg in 
uh, suddenly appearing in the nest. So she's more likely to abandon. So usually the parasite has to time it so that the host is in the middle of May and hasn't completed a clutch. So when they've got one, two, three or four, depending on what, how many birds, how, how many eggs the host lays, they would do that. And then very often the parasites remove an egg at the same time as they lay theirs. So there are lots of experiments looking at whether or not birds can count. And um, there, there isn't very good evidence that they use counting to figure out if there's a parasite egg, but that's been tested. It seems to be more a just general sensation of egg mass that the female might be queuing in on. But a lot of species are very sensitive to color and pattern if they've co-evolved with the host with the parasite for long enough. If whereas if they're naive hosts and they haven't evolved with the parasite at all, then they would probably sit on a golf ball and not notice. I think we we had a, a talk last month about crows, and I think that she was talking about uh, uh, yeah experiments with crows counting and like they can't do numbers, but they can do quantity, like what's yes. more or less. More or less, right. And crows are smart birds, right? So um, when you're looking at something like a warbler, um, it, it seems to be a similar situation of more or less versus I've got exactly four versus five eggs in the nest. Um, yeah. Another question about the the parasitic birds. Um, saying they sometimes will pick an egg out, but do they actually kick out baby like birds yeah. that have hatched, or do they parasite the either yeah. the parents or the the chicks? Very good um, question too. So I mean, you've probably heard the word virulence used in the context of COVID. So people use it for bird parasites as well. And it just means how deadly the parasite is. And so there's a lot of variation across parasite species. So you've got very virulent parasites like the common cuckoo in Europe and Asia, or the greater honey guide in Africa, where the um, the female, once it hatches, will systematically kill every other egg or chick in the nest till it's the only child. And it does this from the moment it hatches. Uh, so the common cuckoo does this by having a special hollow on the back of its, it's evolved a special scooping back where there's a hollow space between where, where its wings are going to grow. And it uses that to leave out all the other eggs or chicks if the eggs have hatched in the nest so that it tosses everything overboard. And it does this straight after it's hatched. So it's blind, it's naked, it doesn't have, barely has any down feathers, anything. And this is its first instinct, is to kill all the competition. So very, very late, right? And the greater honey guide is, uh, hatches with a special bill hook that most birds don't have. And it uses that to stab all the other eggs or um, if there are chicks, it will worry them like a little bulldog until they're all dead, uh, which is very gruesome to see. If you, I, I, I saw it just because I was studying it. And so we would sometimes dig up the nest and see, see these honey guides in the process of worrying corpses that were already dead, but it was still it just had this blind instinct to kill everyone. So those are really virulent examples. But on the other extreme, you've got birds where the parasite is about the same size as the host, including with crows, actually. So there's a European species called the great spotted cuckoo, which often parasitizes either magpies or crows, both of which are very smart, and about the same size or larger than the magpie, I mean, than the cuckoo. And in those situations, the cuckoo, those cuckoos don't kill the host species. They just grow up alongside them. And there's even some evidence from some of those species where 
the cuckoo is not all bad news because nests that have cuckoo chicks in them have less predation sometimes. And some of that's explained by the fact that the cuckoos have a really awful poo that they eject at predators. And so that helps protect everyone, including the host chicks. Um, there's also evidence that those cuckoos are pretty smart and so are the magpies or the crows. So one thing the cuckoos do do is they seem to monitor the, the fate of their chicks in these nests. And if they see that the magpies or the crows have tossed their eggs out, they'll come in and destroy the nest, uh, which is otherwise known as the mafia hypothesis. <laughs> so if people, if the, not people, if the birds um, learn which they do not to reject the cuckoo egg, then the cuckoo just lets everyone carry on together. So that's an example of a brood parasite that's less less virulent. So I'm I'm curious about the the cooperative breeding you were talking okay. about, um, how some groups will stay around together even if they're not part of the breeding pair. Uh, and I'm I was going to ask um, about are there cross species cooperative oh. breeding opportunities and then also what you were just saying about the the crows letting the cuckoos stay in there do the cuckoos stick around do they be become part of that flock or do they yeah. leave once they once they fledge they leave um and how they know what their own species is is a whole nother fascinating thing um in fact some ducks don't which is why you see a lot of hybrid ducks probably is um you know they they grow up as the result of their mum laying an egg in someone else's nest and then they think that they're a different species and when they grow up they end up mating with a different species but they're closely related enough they can hybridize so so some of you have probably seen weird looking ducks that are halfway one species and halfway another and that's part of the that's part of the explanation there. But for most um brood parasites, oh sorry, for most cooperative breeders, yeah. There are no examples of um helping across species. It's actually really rare even to see um it's relatively rare to see helping with non-relatives. So it does exist and there are quite a few species that do help to cooperate with unrelated birds, but that's usually more given to conflict in a sense, because you've got to iron out, if you don't have shared genetic stakes in the offspring because they're cousins or nieces or nephews or grandchildren or something, then um, you've got to make it pay a lot more in other ways. I there was a question about uh, you mentioned something about the the emus and and ostriches. I, I believe oh, you yeah. said that they branched off pretty early. Uh, yeah. And so the question was, are those closer to dinosaurs? Um, it, not really, because if you think about an evolutionary tree they've been evolving for just as long as all other birds that are alive right now. So um, in that sense, I mean, they're not, it's not like they're really more primitive than birds, than something like a robin, that, like than flighted birds. But there are characteristics of their behavior that people wonder if that might be closer to dinosaurs, such as the communal nests do seem to be something that dinosaurs and a lot of these ratites, um, the emus and ostriches and all that share, which uh, other birds don't seem to have anymore, seem to have lost. 
question about uh, human interaction, specifically with with baby birds. Mm. I know that um, yeah. you know if if you see a baby on the ground, there's uh, some people say, oh, pick it up and take it to the Audubon, whereas the Audubon may say, right. you know, just leave it in place; <laughs> it's probably fine. But there was yeah. a, a specific question about okay. um, a a junco pair nesting on a. Uh, one of our attendees patios and s seeing that the chick is left alone a lot of the time and like is that normal should they be worried yeah. no um it depends how big the chick is but i'm guessing it's a fledgling uh so it's really common for birds to have this stage like that we call the fledgling st stage where they're largely covered in feathers and um they're actually somewhat self-sufficient. They're starting to practice flying and things like that. And they, at the stage where they fall out of the nest, heck of a lot. So even if you were to put them back in the nest, they'd start trying to fly and then they'd fall right out again. And, and that's the stage where birds are really, really vulnerable to pet cats. Uh, that's, that's where most, I think, birds being killed by pet cats outdoors happens because the they almost all these flight flighted birds with the very naked pink chicks that hatch and then that get go through this fledgling stage need about a week at least to practice flying and find find their way around and um they do a lot of climbing as, as opposed to just uh flying they they clamber about a lot on branches and they fall a lot so they're not very good at getting around so they're quite vulnerable but they are fed um quite a bit and i've had these house finches outside my feeder and they they they're clearly self-sufficient i mean gosh they they're able to fly all the way up to the fifth floor they can feed themselves and the food is right there but they're still begging like mad whenever they see the adults so the um, one of the things I do write about is this idea of parent-offspring conflict, where the children will often ask for handouts and care for longer than is in the parents' interest to give if the parents are trying to save save energy for the next year and the next batch of kids. I'm I'm curious about, you were pointing out the kiwi that has oh, the yes. very large egg, which yeah, yeah that mentioned uh, though is the care is all by the male in that species so at least there's a you know the female's investment is up front and then she's done yeah it seems like she's done enough at that point right <laughs> yes exactly um i'm curious though is there any kind of um correlation between flighted birds versus not Definitely. flighted versus egg size that kind of thing yeah 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 so i mean if if it was a flighted bird it couldn't afford to have an egg that with that proportion of the mother's body weight and get around but with, in that sense you're talking about um quantity and quality as well so the kiwi can invest a ton in a single egg and since she doesn't have to fly it's all right but if you thought about the total investment in a clutch of eggs or the several clutches of eggs that something like an american robin would lay because they they usually have multiple broods in a season if they can pull it off um if you total up the 20 eggs that a robin might be laying in a season that's still, even if each individual egg is not very big, the total is probably uh, ends up being about the same as the investment in a much bigger egg, like a kiwi egg, I imagine. I haven't done the math, but yeah, it's... <laughs> Um, question about uh, barred owls in the woods behind the oh. house. How do we attract them? Is there anything one oh. can do about that? attract them are they um i guess if are they, if they're nesting uh, or if you can figure out a way to provide good trees for them to nest in 
that seems like the best best way to keep them around. I know there there are bat houses, which obviously bats aren't birds, but are there similar kinds of things where you can for owls? For, for owls? Yeah, I don't know specifically for barred owls, but the close relative, the spotted owl, is very endangered and therefore much more um much more effort has been made to do things like provide holes for them. Uh but this so so I would yeah, I would look up spotted owl recovery efforts and see if you could just borrow that kind of thing for barred owls. Great, thanks. Uh, just a couple more questions. Okay. Uh, are there any other examples of birds similar to the white-throated sparrow where the coloring and personality yeah. Um, yeah. parenting skills are not sex-specific? Yes. Um, so I think one of the other examples I write about is the Goldian finch, which is an Australian bird, but also a very popular pet bird. Um, and there again, the color and the personality are linked and are not a function of the bird's sex. Um, but more generally, there's, uh, if you take the color away, the color side away, just the aspects of personality that vary and whether or not opposites attract or like attracts like is something that people are increasingly studying in birds. So I think I think I write about Stella's jays where um, I think in that case, I can't, I'm not sure I can remember this, but I think that's the opposite in the sense that you either tend to have two shy birds hanging out together or both birds hanging out together and forming a couple. And the, the couples are most successful with birds that are too different in personality don't do well together for Stella's jays. But, you know, Stella's jays are related to crows and magpies, and they're called birds. So both sexes look the same for Stella's jays. They're just going by differences in personality. I'm curious about uh, what what kind of birds are they, the ones that uh, give the their mates the blue things the the they're not birds of paradise blue footed boob boobies no. no the ones who that make the bowers the, the australian oh, bower the bower birds. birds yeah, yeah. do in in courting uh, their their mates are there other birds that give um gifts yeah 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 uh there are lots of birds that give gifts and actually the bower birds aren't really one of them because i i think of the male bower birds as being something like a really fussy um, interior designer or architect or gallery owner or something where the male has his beautiful, carefully curated, perfectly arranged bower that he has spent days and weeks erecting and collecting valuables for and arranging everything so it's just so. And if experimenters, if humans go in and manipulate anything, he comes home and realizes that something is not quite in the right place and he'll rearrange it. And um, in those cases, the males don't give anything to the female. They just have this display. And if it's impressive enough, he gets to mate with the female and that's that. Um, he barely... You know, he doesn't present her with much, but there are lots of birds that give females things. So um, ospreys are one of my favorite examples because they give, they bring gifts of fish and they continue to do this even after the nesting has started and the igling has started, the male will still bring fish, which um, is quite a useful gift, you could say. And then... Um, and a, a lot of fish eaters do that. And um, you've also got a lot of, well, birds like ravens will bring presents, tokens to each other. Um, they're birds that are called babblers, in, very common in the Middle East and Asia, that also 
present each other with tokens like twigs or um, yeah, just fairly arbitrary items, and they use that to to signal interest, mutual interest. And then and then there are other birds that contribute more substantially to to actually nesting material, if it's not food as a gift. Yeah, I guess you did talk about the the what was it superb fairy wrens who give oh, the flowers yeah. yeah yeah that's flower petals yeah so that's another arbitrary one but useless but very sweet um very cute <laughs> yeah and and the other fun thing about that is they tend to choose the flower petals to be complementary to their plumage so if you're a blue species you like to have yellow or orange petals to give to the females wow that's fascinating i know yeah huh. Very cool. and birds birds see in the uv as well so probably what what we see is not exactly what color they see but there's a contrast there so uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about, uh, you know, you were talking about the, the pair bonding and, and divorce occasionally. And, and it oh, seems yeah. like a lot of this is in anthropomorphic language around, you know, things yeah. that are, are that are related to human and is, uh, talking about it's the delayed confusing. dispersal. Um, right. And, you know, it seems like a lot of a lot of people are coming home to live with their parents uh, or staying yes. home. And yes. so can you just talk a little bit about the uh, human values on bird behavior? Sure. So I, I think I tried to deal with this in the introduction of the book because I thought it might be an issue. Um, it's, I think one of my broader points in the book is largely that we're not all that different from other species, including birds. Uh, and a lot of this makes sense, deep evolutionary sense, because some of the hormones that we have that promote feelings of pair bonding or parent-child affection, love, or um, even the hormones that stimulate the production of milk in humans are the same hormones evolutionarily that promote crop milk production by pigeons when they're feeding their Offspring. So, so there's some very deep evolutionary roots to a lot of these behaviors, um, which and a lot of these emotions are basically shared at a molecular level. Um, so, in that sense, as well as in the um, evolutionary biology sense of why does something evolve? Well, it evolves because it helps to pass more genes on. To the, that strategy works for the genes basically to be passed on. Then, from a purely utilitarian kind of genetic investment point of view, the explanation becomes very similar as well. So, um, I guess I would say, with both humans and birds, I wouldn't assume any moral prescriptions that I'm advised, like, I, I would never say well, something just happened to evolve that way, therefore it's morally justifiable. I'm just interested in explaining why it evolved to be the way it is. Not that there's any good or bad to it from a moral point of view. Um, that and makes you sense. could apply that to infanticide, siblicide, divorce, infidelity. <laughs> <laughs> any of those less savory behaviors well and it, and yeah oh. that, I, I basically i'm not justifying them just because they exist in nature um but they do exist and there are right. good evolutionary reasons for why they exist so as my final question, I've been joined by one of my three indoor cats. Um, this is Pippin. He likes yes. to sit on a shoulder. <laughs> um, the So aside from keeping your cats indoors or oh. having a catio that is enclosed yeah. like we do, um, yeah. what other ways can you uh, encourage birds to come into your space? Oh, 
So I'm a big proponent of bird or just wildlife friendly gardens if you can afford, if you have a garden, which I do. Um, otherwise, feeders are feeders are amazingly effective, even in a city and even five floors up. I'm I'm amazed that we get as many birds as we do, but we've got blue jays and morning doves and house finches uh, that come every day, and there's. We've even seen woodpeckers fly up to the fifth floor. And it's not like I live in a haven of, you know, I'm surrounded by concrete. So I, I'm quite impressed that the birds find, find me. Um, but it's the whole feeder thing is interesting because there's definitely an effect that we're having with our bird feeders on bird evolution. We're changing the shapes of their bills with the feeders, where birds, the ex populations with a lot of feeders tend to have longer bills than populations that aren't fed by feeders that much. Um, and at a broader scale, I would say, just you know, trying to help the environment a bit more wherever you are. So definitely one of the things that kills a lot of birds is flying into buildings or flying into windows. Um, so finding ways to make your windows, clear glass windows visible to birds is something that, it's just not such a big deal for houses, but for high rise buildings, it kills a lot of birds. Um, yeah. Yeah, we have a, a feeder outside. Um, and it is very well populated, so oh. I, we enjoy watching them. So that's you good. know, the other thing I noticed is it takes them a long time to find the feeders, but once they do, they come all the time. Right, and it's good entertainment for the indoor cats. So yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> which he just left. So anyway, um, but um, well, with that, I think we'll say thank you to Winfei Tong. Um, it's late where you are. It's oh, it's uh, out on the you. east coast. So I appreciate you taking the time to to be with us um, late yeah. this evening. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, and if. Um, Thanks for being here. And for all of you who are watching, I encourage you to go check out the uh, the earlier event that Wenfei did. Um, it's, again, it's on our YouTube channel. Let me, whoops, let me share Sorry. my screen. Okay, so if you read our email from last Monday, you'll know that we are taking a short break. Um, it's uh, people are out doing fun things now that people are vaccinated and um, we're we've decided that people are probably tired of watching a bunch of zoom videos um so we're going to be taking a quick break or a short break until um september 30th is the next date that we have on our calendar for an online event um we are working on some in-person events as well so mark october 26th i'm not ready to announce either one of those um, but they're both going to be really good so um please keep an eye on our uh on our social media and on our um you know please our emails when we get when we send them to you um if you are interested in being on our mailing list if you're not already when you uh get the survey that we send after this event um, you can sign up on that and we'll keep you apprised of everything that is coming up in the near future so um we'll be back don't worry um just taking a little bit of a break and uh if you are feeling compelled uh, to help us uh, get all of our bills paid and everything, we are largely a volunteer run organization, um, but we do have some staff to pay and also uh, some, you know, got to pay for Zoom and things like that. So if you are um, able to, we greatly appreciate any donations, either as a one time donation or on uh, a monthly uh, donation through Patreon. And you can uh, donate through our nonprofit partner, Make You Think. And with that i'm going to say thank you again to wenfei and um, we will see you again in at the end of september so thank you all for being here and we'll see you in a couple of months